Hey everyone, thanks for coming and uh, welcome to Automate Instagram with Python and Selenium. And I hope you're a little bit excited because we'll be talking about some great stuff, including why you should use automation, what Selenium is. We'll actually do some Instagram automation right here and talk about a page object design pattern. And after that, we'll quickly take a look at my tool, Instapy. And last but not least, we will go into why open source is important and how you can level up your own open source pro a portfolio and projects. Uh, like has been said, I'm Tim, and I'm currently a CS student in Germany and the creator of Instapy. And if you have any questions, feel free to contact me on any of the social medias or directly via Gmail. I'll be happy to chat. And if you have any questions t later today or tomorrow, uh, and you can't remember my face, I got this white dot on the back of my head, and it's really kind of to uh, remember me. Also, make sure to follow me on Twitter because I'll be posting a slide still later. But now, without wasting any further time, let's get right into it. So why should you do automation? I'm pretty sure every single one in this room has at least one task he could and actually should automate. But they don't do it. They instead just do it by hand. And I interestingly got some emails through Instapy from social marketing companies that told me, that asked me to automate their Instagram growth process because they have like um, one or two people sitting there and logging into clients' accounts, liking pictures, commenting stuff, and following people. And they do it all by hand, eight hours a day. And I think this is really ridiculous, especially since automating stuff is most of the time one-time effort. You don't have to do it every time. You might have to uh, make some slight adjustments, but the big part is done. And it will save you time the more, the more often you have to do it, especially since a lot of tasks are easier or automatable than you actually think they are. I just recently had to send an email to every single uh, contact on a CSV file, and I could have gone in there and do this by hand, but instead I just wrote a script to go through the CSV file and send out an email to everything so I had time for more important stuff. And speaking of Instagram or Twitter, Facebook, you could actually do something like this. But as things get more complex, this will really explode in complexity and has some disadvantages. That's why we will use a software-only solution, and we will use Selenium here. And I don't know how many of you have heard of Selenium. Uh, could you give me a quick hand sign? Oh, okay, that's quite a lot. For those who don't know, uh, Selenium is actually a testing tool for front ends, especially uh, web front ends, but you can also do it with Java front ends. And uh, yeah, it's actually for testing your web apps. For example, you could test a Flask uh, web app with it. But it's also very good for automating boring tasks, which, of course, liking stuff uh, on Instagram is if you want to do it efficiently. And who has already heard of React, Vue.js, or Angular? Probably everyone. And you can't uh, crawl websites which are dynamically rendered like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram with, with uh, simple requests. That's why Selenium is also very interesting. And since we're using Python here, installing it is as easy as pip install Selenium. And we're now ready to do some real Instagram automation. So let's just take a look at what we ha have to do. We have to start a new browser. We have to navigate to Instagram. Once we're on Instagram, we can log us in. And once we're logged in, we can then start to click these little hearty icons to actually like pictures. And since we're using Selenium here, this is really easy. And we have to simply import the web driver element from, Sel uh, from Selenium. And once we've done that, we can instantiate our new, a new browser. And in our case, we will just use the Chrome browser here. But you can use Firefox or check out the documentation, which browsers are also supported. And in the braces here, you can pass the path to the Chrome driver. This is not necessary, but gives you some nice um, security on different platforms. And once we've got our browser object ready, we can then use the get method to navigate to any page. In our case, of course, this is Instagram. 
And once we're on Instagram, we can then get to our next step. And well, the sleep is just here to make sure the browser doesn't close instantly and we can see something. And the browser that closes here for a clean exit, which is recommended by Selenium. Now let's take a look at what happens. So if we enter, if we start the script, we will see that uh, it opens a new browser and navigates to Instagram. And if we're now on Instagram, we can we see that there is uh, um, there is no login uh, form. It's simply the sign up form, and we have to make sure we get to the login form here. Do you see that? Um, and in this case, there is this little login link on the bottom of the page with which we can switch from the sign up form to the login form. And this is a really good point to introduce a new concept here uh, from Selenium. And this is finding and clicking elements. So, so we, in order to find an element on a page, we can take a look at a page source and we have to find a nice signature of the element. And in this case, it's just an A tag with the class of underscore FC and so on, and the text of login. So we use that knowledge to get the element. We are a browser element. And for Chrome, you can simply use the dev tools as well as Safari. They all have very nice dev tools where you can search elements pretty efficiently. If we translate this into code now, we can use our browser object to find element by XPath, and for those who don't know, XPath is just a query language for XML documents, as HTML in this example. And the XPath here is just, like I said, we will use the uh, A-Link as an anchor, and uh, uh, the, we will search for the A-Link, which has an tag, uh, a name of login, and text of login in this case. And since we now have the login element, we can simply do trigger a click on it, which will actually trigger a click on the login element here. And you can see this little flickering, and this is just Selenium clicking on the link, login link to get us to the login form here. Perfect, so we now in the login form and can log us in. We now have only have to send our username and password to the login form, and once we've done that, we are logged in to Instagram. So let's check that out. We first have to, again, check the page source for our elements. And we'll also introduce a new concept here, which is called action chains. And it does what it is called after. It simply chains actions together. And in this case, we will just look for the form element and the login button. And if we, yeah, then translate this into code again, we will get something like this. And again, we will use the browser element to find stuff by XPath. And for the inputs, it's just for slash form slash div slash input, which is, of course, the XPath for our input form. And then we can instantiate a new action chain element, which will pass the browser. And we then have in, uh, access to some methods here, which are move to element, click, send keys, and perform, which will trigger the whole action chain to uh, execute. And if we take a look at the code from bottom to, uh, from the top to the bottom, we first move to the first input element, which is the username. We then click the input element. And this will really have a, a more natur natural feeling and a more human feeling than just triggering clicks by JavaScript. And after we clicked into this user element, we can then send our username to it. In this case, it's contacting John Doe. And once we've done that, we can move to the second form element, of course, and send our password in there. After we entered our password and username, we can then simply create a new action chain and, of course, click the element. And I just added a second action chain here because um, you have to see that it, you can also use it for one element only. You don't have to have like 10 elements or two or three. So again, let's take a look at what this code snippet does. And in this case, it will just go in and enter username and password and click the login element here. And of course, this will trigger our 
Instagram to load the feed page and we are actually now logged in successfully. This is where it gets interesting because once we're logged in, we can't instantly start cl clicking on these hearty icons because we, when we take a close look at Instagram and Twitter, of course, and Facebook all have this feature, there is this little circle loading, uh, loading circle on the bottom of the page which will only get new content once we reach the bottom of the page, so there's not an, too big of an overhead here. And this will just dynamically load new content into our page, and depending on how many images, how many stuff we want, we have to first get, get hold of that and make sure that we have enough pa elements on the page. If we want to do 20, it's not a problem, but if we want to do 100 or 200 elements on our front page, we will have to tackle this. And Again, we will introduce a new concept, which are special keys. And with the normal uh, send, uh, send keys method, we can simply send text like our username and password, but we have to use special keys for stuff like delete, enter, spacebar, and in our case, uh, home, the home and the end key, which will trigger the page to go to the top of the page, and the end key will trigger it to be a, go to the bottom. And let's translate this into code again. This will lead to something like this. We have to import the keys, the special keys from Selenium again, and from then on we can simply use the keys. And here's a special special element uh, which we have to define before the, is the body element because we need an anchor to send our commands to. We need an anchor to send the keys to. And we can't just use maybe the Instagram logo or something like that, but we have to have a uh, really a solid solid element which will stay the same. In this case, it's the body element because it's, of course, the element you click in and you operate in when you're using the browser yourself. And then we can simply do a for loop and in this case, we will do it three times. We will go to the bottom of the page, to the top again, to the bottom of the page and we'll sleep two seconds in between each to make sure that the loading actually succeeds and we will get new content. So if we take another look at how this code gets executed, you will see that it moves to the bottom of the page and it moves up again and it's, it's all it does. It just executes this three times in a row to make sure we got like 50 elements here to later like. So there is only one step left here, which is finding all the hard elements and clicking them. And you should now be able to do this all by yourself because it's, we introduced all the concepts here, which are finding elements and clicking elements, of course. And if we take another look at the page source here, we just have to find these hard icons and find another signature here, make sure that the signature is unique to make sure that we don't get a, another element on the page, but exactly the one we, need, we want to. And in this case, we will use the class. We will use several classes to make, really make sure that we will get only these elements. And we'll just loop over it. And we will do some printing to make sure that uh, we keep track of how many elements we already liked. And if we enumerate through it, we will, of course, add another sleep to make sure we don't, don't get banned here. We will get something like this where we start up our script from the start and we will see everything we've done right now. So it starts a new browser, it navigates to Instagram. Once we're on Instagram, it will log us in. And once we're logged in, it will then, as we saw before, start to move to the bottom of the page, to the top again. And once it's loaded enough images, it can finally start to like some pictures. We'll just wait a few seconds here until it's done. And you can, we'll then see that the page is really like jumping a little bit, there you go. And it, you see that the hard icons turn red. And this is really just a very simple automation of, of the liking for your newsfeed. And you can enter, you can add your own automation right now. You can do filtering for friends, you can for example, make sure you don't like your own pictures. You can add commenting and you can add following for the people you actually see on the front page or maybe even 
copy the pictures and post them yourself or something like that. Depends on what you really depends on what you want to do with it. But as you see, as you've seen right now, we heavily rely on the page structure, and this leads to some problems here because Instagram, Facebook, and all these big pages where it would be interesting to do some automation on, they change their page layout pretty recently and pretty often, and this really leads to breaks in the code and and make sure that the code is not working very long. And this is really annoying to fix, but it's pretty quick, actually. And we'll look into some ideas on how to make this more maintainable and get, make sure that our code is solid, more solid. The second thing is different languages. We saw that we rely on the login text for searching for elements here, and this is really bad for different countries where we have, for example, here in Italy, it of course, would be Italian, on, in France, it would be French, and so on. So we can't, we shouldn't rely on the page, uh, on the page language. But Selenium offers a really nice feature here which we, with, with which we can simply um, force the browser to use a specific language, and we can just enforce it to use English in this case. And the most annoying problem is A-B testing. And all of these big companies, of course, do A-B testing. For those who don't know, A-B testing is just um, rolling out features to a small group in a specific area, like, for example, all right, we have a new feature. We will test it in, only in Rimini. And if the people in Rimini think this feature is good and like this feature and there are no problems with this feature, they will roll it out incrementally to more and more people to make sure that every person on the planet if for these big companies uh, gets a new feature. And testing this is really annoying because you have to make sure you get all the information from your users. All right, where, where are they located? What's the, what's the language of their system? What system are they using? And all of these small little details which will, or which can lead to a failure that is really unique to, this, to that person. <clears throat> but Selenium uh, uh, recommends a pay, uh, things an object design pattern for this page. It's called page object design pattern, and it, of course, is what it tells. It's an object for every page, so we would have an, an object for our login page. We would have an object for our news page, and so on. And this really gets us more maintainable code because we only have one place to make our changes around the UI. So, in order to make changes right now. Uh, we would have to go through all, all, the whole code and make all the changes to the X path, and this is really, really annoying, and we don't want to do that. It also reduces uh, duplicated code because it has a nice layer of abstraction here, which will move all the code to one one big bulb, and in this code, in, in this place, there will be the only logic. Third thing is. It adds, through this abstraction layer, it adds, adds a nice API layer, which we can then use in our actual code base to kind of get some readable code. And, and if we add some comments and um, little hints where, what we did here, we can really get nice contributors and make sure that the contributors understand our code and can contribute as well. And since we're all real programmers here, we will look at an UML diagram of this page up to this design pattern here. And it looks something like this. Well, no, yeah, just joking. It looks more like this. And as you can see here, this is an example of the Google search page uh, where every attribute is an element. And in this case, for example, the URL is an attribute, the search box is an attribute, and so on. And every method wraps an action, for example, navigation, searching, and clicking the field lucky button, for example. And of course, it is actually a test pattern, so we have an actual test class here. For each page object, we need a test object here. And don't, know, uh, don't matter if you got this right now, we will look at an example with Instagram here. And we'll use the Instagram login form for this. We'll, we won't focus on, on the App Store buttons or the login, uh, the sign-up 
uh, link here. We'll just focus on the username input, the password input, uh, input, and the login button here. And if you again translate this into code, we will get something like this, where we have a class for our install login page, and we in, within the constructor, constructor, we will define every attribute, every element, as we said recently. For, in this case, it will be the user box, the password box, and the login button. And once we found all these elements, we can then use it in the complete, in the full class right now. So in our case, we will implement the login method, and it will get past the username and password. And here in, in the login method, we can then instantiate a new action chain and go through all the methods here and do move to element like we did before. And one interesting thing about the page object design pattern is that it returns a new page object for the next page we will move to. So in our case, as you saw when we log in, we will move to the, insta of in the, to the feed page where our news feed is located. So we will return a new instance of the Insta feed page object in our case. So the, no, right now we will switch over to InstaPy because you don't want to implement this all yourself and think about how you can implement this and break your head about what, what changes Instagram makes and something like that. And I'm really amazed and really excited to talk about this here today because this is actually what led to this talk and um, I'm really excited how big this got and what the open source community made out of this. And it is called InstaPy, of course. And right now we have around 2K stars on GitHub, which is, I think, pretty nice for something like this, especially since there are a lot of services out there which got taken down by Instagram itself, but there were, in there were services out there. And this is really completely open source. Everyone can contribute and look at it and uh, even copy it if they want to. I have uh, 32 contributors which are from which Four are into the core developer team right now, and we got over 420 forks of this project. And I hope there is a lot more to come because I want to keep this alive and make sure that people can actually use it. And these many contributors, these many interested people, leads them to some very interesting stuff. Like an active community means there is quick help for everyone. So if someone submits an issue, there's an if if I can't helping me with this issue. There are like 100, 200 people that maybe have, have the same problem who can also comment on his stuff and, uh, and help me fix all the problems and make sure that the people actually can use this. And to give you kind of an impression what InstaPy can do, here's a little list of features. Of course, you can do following, liking, unfollowing, commenting. You can like by tag and you can target your users specifically by location, for example, if you have a, um, a pizzeria or uh, any kind of shop, you can make sure that only people in your location will be notified. Of course, it works on a server, so you can use DigitalOcean or any kind of virtual server to run it. Uh, it has Docker support, you can, write, uh, you can post emojis, and one interesting thing is clarify. I don't know how many of you know Clarify, but it's an image, a smart image recognition API. And with it, you can make sure that you don't like any not safe for work stuff or inappropriate stuff, or maybe you're, you're from some country and you don't want to like nude stuff, or it depends on your preferences. And you can really make sure that the comment, pictures you comment on and the people you follow are not some kind of weirdos here. And I think the API is pretty interesting too. So this is what it looks like. You just have to import InstaPy from InstaPy. And in the InstaPy constructor, you can then just pass your username and password. And after the login, you can do some settings. In this case, we will just make sure that we don't interact with any account that has more than 2,500 followers. And we want to do commenting on 10% as well as following on 10%. We want to use the comments, cool, awesome, and nice. Um, and we don't want to make sure that this, this bots don't interact with our real friends, so we can make sure that our real friends are not included here. And of course, we can do some text search where not safe from work and naked are excluded. And what if some of these don't include words are included in the text, it will skip the, pay, uh, the picture and not like it. 
And then we can finally do some liking by tags, for example. In this case, we will just like 100 pictures for nature and CAD. And let's talk about open source in general and why it's important. And I'm pretty sure a lot of people in here already do open source, and this is awesome, but those who don't know, or those who don't do it, you really have to think, think about it. If you have any project on your, on your hard drive that could be open source, why not do it? I mean, all, of, all in here already use open source for their projects, but why not give something back to the community? If you have something laying around, it doesn't matter if you contribute it to GitHub or GitLab and make it open source for people to use it. And I think this is really the most important thing to think about. It's also good for new developers to build a portfolio because people will find you on the internet and if you've got great stuff, they might contact you, might want to work with you, and even companies get interested in you. And this is where you get opportunities from. And if you, if you really look interesting, they'll contact you so you don't have to send out any, any papers or something like that to, make sh to appli applicate on uh, companies. To make it nice for you and give you a little bit of motivation, here is what open source did for me. By now, I got 12 job offers and nine internship, op internship offers sorry, from around the world, as well as a ton of new contacts that contacted me through Instapy. And I think this really speaks for itself. If you've got something that's, that's interesting and maybe a little bit controversial, it's really uh, just a matter of time until until people think about it and, and talk about it and really give you feedback on it and want to help out. And these job offers and contacts are from around the world, including Sweden, Sydney, Argentina, Brasilia, the UK, USA, even from uh, Ireland and Singapore or Shanghai. And I think this really speaks for itself. And of course, I got this talk from it, which is nice for me as well. To close this off, here are some tips I think are really important for your open source portfolio. If you're interested in, to do, in doing some open source stuff, make sure to include or to keep this information and keep, make sure to improve these tips here. The first one is add documentation. I've seen so many projects out there who has not uh, have, have no real documentation, and this is, this is really crucial. I know it's annoying for people to write documentation, but if people don't understand your project or don't even know what the features of your project are, this is, this is just insane. How, should they, use, should they look, take a look into the code? I don't think so. R uh, really few people actually do that. The second is spread the word. You can use channels like Hacker News, Reddit, or Dev Post, something like this, to make sure that people actually see your, pro, um, your portfolio and your projects to make sure that you get feedback and, and people to uh, get people to talk about your tool. And if nobody, since nobody, if nobody hears about your project, of course nobody will use it. The last one is support the users. And this is really time consuming but it's really worth it. It's a lot of work, but it's worth it. And if somebody uses your tool and it, he stops using your tool because if they don't get it to work, they will never come back and you'll, uh, you lost the chance to get a new user. So what, what's next for, for Instapy and this project? We want you to take a look at it, maybe contribute it, use it, give us feedback and maybe add some issues or something like that. We, will, we want to add new features like a GUI, smarter following, and more human automation. And like, like I said, if you have any questions or recommendations, offers, anything, just make sure to contact me on any of the social medias or Gmail, and I'll be happy to chat later or through one of these channels. Thank you for your attention.